true murder. It's a rare insight into a killer's tortured mind. The most shocking killers in true crime history. Victims were, were brutalized, shot, stabbed. And the authors that have written about them. Easy, Bundy, Dahmer, The Night Stalker, BTK. Every week, another fascinating author talking about the most shocking and infamous killers in true crime history. True Murder, with your host, journalist and author, Dan Zupanski. Good evening. In the early hours of March 22nd, 1989, two friends, career criminals with violent felony convictions, drove around the eastern Kansas City area in a stolen car committing a series of crimes. The weather was mild for late March in Kansas City. The sky was clear, and there was the pale remnant of a full moon that bore the dubious name of Death Moon, the last full moon of winter. A little before 7 a.m., 15-year-old Ann Harrison walked to the end of her driveway on Kansas City's east side to wait for the bus to take her to Raytown South High School. Ten minutes later, she disappeared, but no one saw what happened. As if waiting for her return, her belongings were still stacked carefully by the side of the road. By the side of the road is the true crime story of the kidnapping, rape, and murder of Ann Harrison and the long journey forced upon her family, who had to wait nearly three decades to see her killers brought to final justice. The book that we're featuring this evening is By the Side of the Road, the true story of the abduction and murder of Ann Harrison, with my special guest, victim rights advocate and author, Marla Bernard. Welcome to the program, and thank you so much for this interview, Marla Bernard. Thank you for having me, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you for this extraordinary book, By the Side of the Road. Let's talk about, right away, about this suburb, Raytown, in Kansas City, Missouri, and Annie Harrison. Tell us your connection to the Harrison family, and tell us about Annie Harrison, who had just turned 15 years old, and her family, Bob and Janelle. Raytown, Missouri is a small suburb of Kansas City. In 1989, it was a very, very quiet, low crime area. It was one of those Midwestern cities that you would choose to live in, want to raise a family, great community excellent school district. And again, it's on the east side of Kansas City, very close to where Bob and Janelle Harrison and Harrison's parents lived and still live in the community. I have had the pleasure, privilege of knowing the Harrisons for approximately 30 years. I was reserve police sergeant for Kansas City, Missouri. And my husband was a homicide sergeant for almost 30 years for Kansas City and worked with Bob when he started out as a reserve police officer. So we have had an association with them for many, many years. Anne Harrison was a very shy, very sensitive girl. She would go out after a rainstorm and rescue worms off the sidewalk. She rescued Mm -hmm. animals. She loved pets. At the time of the incident, she had just turned 15 years old and was very sports-minded. She loved sports. She was an honor student. She played the flute in the band at Raytown South High School. Just a very, very sweet, innocent young lady um, who was always highly spoken of by family, friends, teachers, the community. Tell us what happens on that fateful day, March 22nd, around 7 a.m. Anne was getting ready for school. Her mom reminded her on an intercom that they had in Anne's room. They had a basement bedroom set up for her. And she let her mother know that she was heading out to school, walked out her front door a little after 7 a.m., 
walked down her driveway about 65 feet from the front door, set down her books and her purse and her flute, and was standing there waiting for the school bus. And the next thing her mother knew, Janelle Harrison knew, the school bus was honking for Anne, and she was gone. She had just mysteriously vanished, if you will. What actually had occurred in the course of the events was that two individuals who had been stealing parts from vehicles had been out cruising all night, drinking and carousing, and they saw Anne standing at the curb by the side of the road, and they abducted her within a matter of moments. Let's get back to this abduction, and you talk about the reaction from her mother. She seems to have just disappeared. She runs next door to see if she possibly was there, maybe in the backyard, maybe went back in the home. So she calls her husband and he speeds home from work. And you say she also calls the Kansas City Police Department as well to report missing. What else happens in terms of a call to her husband? Janelle called Bob. He responded immediately. He also notified his brother. Paul Harrison was a captain with the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department at that time. Helicopters were up almost instantly. People were putting out flyers and worked at the the grocery store in Raytown near their home. She had a little part-time job. They were putting flyers out. The people at Arrowhead Stadium here in Kansas City, our football team, they were printing off flyers. They had notified the trucking agencies here. They had truckers out looking for her. It was a very very active response to try and find her. A lot of times you'll see on cases, not so much since Amber Alerts, but prior to that, in in this time frame, departments would stand back and say, you know, is she a runaway? Should we wait 20, 40, 20 or 48 hours to see whether or not she might have just decided to leave home for what they didn't have an explanation for at that time and did not fit any of the criteria for that. And fortunately, they were able to mobilize very quickly, but to no avail. It was as though she clearly had just vanished. Now you introduced Sergeant Troy Cole and he he's in a homicide unit, but he hears about an abandoned car, stolen car, a Monte Carlo. And he's an experienced homicide detective who had investigated, worked on the with the serial killer on the serial killer case of Robert Burdella, who they called the Kansas City Butcher. So how do police proceed? Because there are witnesses that have seen the vehicle and do have some recollection of the perpetrators. Tell us about some of the witnesses' claims. Witnesses called in. They got an immediate response from people. The closest description was a Chevrolet vehicle, but was reported to be brown in color. And as it ended up, it was a blue car that was found when... The officers, within about 36 hours, there was a report of an abandoned vehicle. And when officers, when the officer responded to take the report, it was on a blue Monte Carlo. They were able to identify the owner. When that car was stolen, there were actually two vehicles stolen from the same location, a white car and this blue Monte Carlo. Uh, they recovered the, the Monte Carlo, notified the owner of the vehicle. She responded with her boyfriend. And as luck would have it, there was a problem with the vehicle that it leaked antifreeze. They had brought an extra gallon to put into the vehicle when The gentleman, the boyfriend, went to put the remaining antifreeze in the trunk of the car. They opened the trunk and found that they did not have an abandoned stolen vehicle, but what they had was an active crime scene, and Harrison was in the trunk of that vehicle. 
that's when Troy Cole got notified. He was what they call the floor sergeant in homicide that evening, taking calls. When they determined that they did have a homicide scene, they called in what's known as the murder squad. That was a newly developed program in Kansas City. A captain named Gary Van Buskirk developed it. And they work generally days, but they are on 24-hour call when they have victim and no suspects. And that specialized squad comes in and takes over the case and works that case until it is solved. And so it passed from Sergeant Troy Cole to who was a seasoned, seasoned sergeant and got the case prepared to hand off to Pete Edland, who was the the sergeant on call at that time. He and his squad the murder squad, and it's aptly named because that's what they dealt with was just murders where there's, you know, no suspect, not a lot of information, and they they literally work it from the ground up. Regarding information, what is the condition that they find Ann Harrison in? What did they find from the medical examiner's exam, the autopsy? What was in terms of the wounds rendered? Anne had been stabbed a total of 10 times. She had been stabbed in the neck, in the the chest area, and was just, she was in a fetal position in the trunk of the vehicle when they found her. She was partially clothed. She had, her clothing was kind of, like I say, partially removed. It appeared that she had tried to dress herself or had dressed herself with clothing that was inside out. A shoe, a sock were not on. She, based on what the medical examiner determined, she had remained conscious for about 15 minutes after she was stabbed and lived for approximately two hours after she was so brutally stabbed and then just left in the trunk of the car. After this autopsy, there is the Buick Riviera, the second car that they found, which was stolen at the same time. And the similarities in some of the things that the thieves did to make sure that they grabbed these cars and used them and um, were able to steal them, including pry marks on the door, the car radio gone, the ashtray gone the dome light removed and the bulb removed. So very similar things were done with both vehicles, the police noticed. Then there was a March 26th homicide unit is the Grandview police report a high-speed chase that they have to abandon because it was out of their jurisdiction because it was traffic light or something. But anyway, the witnesses had also seen a couple black males and other witness testimony regarding the stolen vehicle. Tell us about that. There were actually two car chases, well, multiple attempts to identify car thieves, if you will. The first incident was early in the morning, about three o'clock in the morning, on the morning that Anne was abducted. The Lee Summit Police Department, which is also another suburb of Kansas City, and it actually for the, the location where this occurred at Kansas City and Lee Summit and Raytown kind of join up at the highway. Police officer in Lee Summit noticed a vehicle with a tail light out and attempted to stop that vehicle just for a tail light and ended up getting into a high speed car chase with the driver. There were two black males in the vehicle and Once they reached the city limits of Lee Summit, where it connected into Kansas City, Missouri, he had to suspend the chase. There was no probable cause for him to continue trying to stop that vehicle because it was just an attempt to stop for equipment. That's all all the reasoning he had to be able to do that. So there was car chase number one, unbeknownst. To that officer at the time, the car was stolen and it was occupied by what would then become the two primary suspects in the case. After Anne was abducted and murdered, the Grandview Police Department 
yet another suburb, and they just kind of surround Kansas City, if you will, had found that there was a vehicle that had been stolen, and they attempted to stop the individuals, got into a car chase. The individuals abandoned the vehicle, took off on foot, and what they determined was that that vehicle had been stolen at the same location that the vehicle that Ann was in had been stolen at approximately the same time. And the MO for the individual that or individuals that stole that matched the way that the blue Monte Carlo had been broken into. Again, they had pried the driver's side door lock, pulled the dome light pulled the radio, broken into the steering column in the same method that a number of other vehicles in that same time frame had been broken into. What they determined was that apparently these individuals were looking for T-tops that they could sell at a local chop shop that provided drugs and or money for those items. But there were patterns that the auto theft unit and the homicide unit and even the Grandview officers who were working the stolen vehicles could see that there was a pattern in these that appeared to be the same perpetrator or perpetrators doing them because it was so consistent in the manner in which they broke into those vehicles and stole them. One of the perpetrators with their focus on car thieves, was a person, one of these perpetrators that they brought in for questioning, but he wasn't very cooperative at all, not wanting to give up hair samples, not wanting to sign a Miranda without an attorney. So he was not cooperative. This is in May. Correct. Now, the tip line is very, very active. And of course, they've got to run down any lead, whether it's promising or not, they don't know. But in June 21st, anonymous tip came in. What does that anonymous tipster say and who does he name as the perpetrators? What is the incredible murderous tale he tells and who is he? The the caller had information that the police had not released to the public. He called up and told a tale of a friend that he had been with who in the course of a a conversation, said that he was involved in the abduction and subsequent murder, rape and murder, of a girl he called Annie, Annie Harris. Again, he had details that had not been released. He told of two individuals that he knew that the one individual He referred to as Roger, which the call taker was trying to get all this information down and they were looking to see what information they had available. Very astute call taker was wise enough to keep this gentleman on the line and contact the murder squad. One of the detectives got him on the line and he agreed giving giving some cursory information, but probably one of the best leads they'd had so far, agreed to come in the next day and meet with detectives. That gentleman, his name was Kareem Hurley. He was very adamant that he knew Roger Nunley, a known car thief who had been brought in along with a lot of other individuals who had been brought in for questioning because he Fit the MO had been in the area. So the the detectives began connecting the dots with these individuals. And Kareem Hurley was very forthcoming with details that Nunley had shared. He also knew the other occupant of the vehicle, the other suspect, whose name was Michael Taylor, and knew that. He knew Roderick or Roger Nunley very well and said he will not be forthcoming. He will be a tough nut to crack. You need to talk to Michael Taylor first and see if you can get information from him related to this case. Both Kareem Hurley and Roderick Nunley had been suspects in other murder cases 
one where they were both suspects in one particular murder case. So detectives knew that they had someone who had some inside information on Nunley and and Taylor, Roderick Nunley and Michael Taylor. Roderick Nunley was out on bail for another crime that he had committed, had jumped bail, and officers were aggressively looking for him, but he was able to elude them for a few more weeks. Michael Taylor was incarcerated and in prison being held on some other charges. And so it made it a little easier for detectives to go and conduct the first interview, with the first of the two suspects. Oh, you're right about that interview with this Taylor. How much of that, his story differs from what Kareem Hurley testified to? Taylor and Hurley were very consistent about the events that occurred with the crime up to the point where Taylor states that, no, he did not rape Ann Harrison. It was Roderick Nunley who grabbed her and pulled her into the vehicle and subsequently raped her and murdered Ann or struck the first blows, if you will, that decided to stab her. But overall, the facts of the case were were pretty consistent about where she was standing. She was pulled into the vehicle that they went to Nunley's mother's home where she was forced to crawl on her hands and knees into the basement of that home where she was raped and then forced to crawl back to the vehicle, placed in the trunk and murdered. So they were pretty consistent with that. But about that point is when the finger pointing between Nunley and Taylor occurred. Kareem Hurley knew Roderick Nunley well enough and other witnesses, other acquaintances would State, when you were in a vehicle with Roderick Nunley, he always insisted on driving the vehicle. Always. He would not ride with anyone else. He had to be in charge of operating that motor vehicle. And that was what Nunley insisted on, that he was the one driving the motor vehicle. They were, the original intent was to grab Anne's belongings just to rob her when Michael Taylor jumped out of the car and elected to abduct Anne instead. And they they did not take any of the belongings. So he was the one that pulled Anne into the vehicle. Whereas he, he, being Taylor, states that it was Nunley who pulled her into the vehicle. So that's where some of the inconsistencies are. But overall, the, the timeline, the location, most of the events that took place, where they took place, these were all things that Kareem Hurley knew where, where the actual attack on and occurred. And those things were were substantiated by both Nunley and Taylor. It was just who did what first that was conflicting in their statements. Let's use this as an opportunity, Marla, to stop for a second to hear from our sponsor, which is Skylight Frame. The holidays are just around the corner. Looking for a good gift idea that your parents or in-laws will genuinely love? It's hard to find gifts for family members, especially parents and grandparents who seem to have everything or say they have everything they need. Plus, you want to give them something meaningful. Skylight is the perfect gift. My parents love the Skylight frame. My daughter in London sends my folks photos of her European vacations and my brother sends photos from his place in British Columbia. Multiple people can send photos to the frame So it's a great way to keep large networks of friends and families in touch. It has a black frame and white mat, so it looks like a real photo frame that adds a beautiful touch to your home. Sending photos to Skylight is effortless. Everyone in the family can use the app or just email them to the Skylight and they'll pop up in seconds. It's so simple that my non-tech-savvy parents could set it up and use it. Now, as a special offer, you can get $15 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame when you go to skylightframe.com 
and enter code SHOCKING. That's right. To get $15 off your purchase of a Skylight Frame, just go skylightframe.com and enter code SHOCKING. That's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T-F-R-A-M-E dot com. Promo code SHOCKING. Now, Marla, the law enforcement has these two perpetrators. They have incredible amount of evidence. They have testimony from three people to connect the dots to know who exactly did what, despite the conflicting testimony of these two perpetrators. Now, with the courts, how did the prosecutor proceed in this case? They had irrefutable DNA evidence. They had witnesses. They had the confessions from both of the killers. And when they went to trial, the prosecutors in Jackson County, Missouri, were going to seek the death penalty for these two individuals based on the felony murder. She was abducted and murdered in the course of committing another crime, which was kidnapping. So you had kidnapping, you had rape, you had assault, and of course, ultimately murder. It was the decision of the defense attorneys or their recommendation to Taylor and Nunley that they go for a bench trial in lieu of a jury trial. They thought that perhaps they stood a better chance of avoiding the death penalty. And the judge who heard their case had conducted bench trials previously and had not meted out the death penalty, had elected to uh, sentence the individuals to life in prison without the possibility of parole. So that was the direction that the case took. And it was up to the judge at that time to determine whether or not Taylor and Nunley would be given the death penalty. And as it turned out in this particular case, both individuals were sentenced by the judge to be executed in the state of Missouri who had and still has the death penalty. I don't know the order of this when it happened, but there was some rough justice meted out to Michael Taylor in prison, wasn't there? When the detectives went to meet with Michael Taylor in prison, before he gave his interview, he asked to be able to call his family. He wanted to speak to his mother, and I believe he was only able to speak with his sister, who had told him, Michael, if you're guilty, if you did this, you need to tell them what happened. And at that point, he did. He was interviewed by the detectives, videotaped at the prison, because, again, he was incarcerated at the time that Kareem Hurley called the TIPS hotline. They took his statement, and in correctional facilities, nothing is secret. Nothing happens that inmates don't find out about, figure out pretty quickly. And I'm assuming, I don't know this, the, the details as they they transpired, how it got communicated, but I'm assuming when corrections officers went to get Taylor to take him to be interviewed, some fairly astute prisoners were able to put together that Taylor was being interviewed for a murder case involving this murder and murder rape abduction in Kansas City. After he was interviewed and agreed to submit blood and hair samples, Taylor was going to be sent back to his cell. And at the request of the detectives and the corrections officers, it was determined that they, discretion being the better part of valor, he should be put in solitary confinement just for his own protection. However, the prison was under instructions that no prisoner could be placed in solitary confinement without permission of the warden. They were not able to reach him. This was on a weekend, so they were not able to get in contact with him. So they put Taylor back in the general population. There is, I guess you could say, some honor 
uh, amongst thieves or at least a hierarchy. Pedophiles, rapists are are not highly thought of, shall we say, in in prison. Taylor, because of the fact that he abducted and murdered or was, you know, had confessed to abducting and murdering this little girl, was attacked in the prison by other inmates and actually was forcibly raped by other inmates and required medical care and 80 stitches in the prison infirmary. So he got his what I described as his first taste of justice for Anne and had to experience a little of what he had put Anne through. So it was sort of a a reckoning that the universe kind of descended upon him, if you will, and he was he was attacked in the prison. Let's get back to the trial itself. Well, not a trial, but the sentencing and the sentencing phase of that trial as well. February 9th, 1991, Taylor took the stand 12 days after that, admitted to first-degree murder, rape, kidnapping, and armed criminal action. And he was questioned the same as Nunley. And he pled guilty, asked if he was understood the proceedings, and he agreed. And he's aware that there was a risk of the death penalty and Basically, he he knew that there could be no appeal. There could be a good possibility or a possibility of the death penalty. And he took their chances rather than have a jury. And they were sentenced to death, both of them. Now, what happens with the appeal process? We're talking about 1991. When What happens in the appeal process? Tell us about some of the events along the way. During the sentencing phase, the judge had already prepared his documents for for his ruling and was going to announce that ruling. They were going to take a break, break for lunch, and then he would come back and announce his ruling. The judge went to lunch and was observed having an alcoholic drink with lunch. When they came back, he meted out the sentence, handed down the death penalty sentence to both Roderick Nunley and Michael Taylor. But by virtue of the fact that he had been observed having a drink, it laid the groundwork for the first of many appeals that Taylor and Nunley had. They wanted to be heard in front of a new judge. And they were granted that appeal and they were heard, their case was heard by a new judge that was appointed. And it was quite a lengthy process to find a judge, get a, to get a judge appointed that there were no conflicts, no potential conflicts related to the case so that it was going to be heard fairly and could be ruled upon. And that occurred several times. There were a number of judges during the appeals, that the case was was heard again and again. Again, this was the sentencing process, not the entire case, but the sentencing process of the case. And on every one of those appeals, the judges upheld the original ruling. And over the course of the next 24 years, because the original case was occurred two years after Anne's murder. There was an appeals process that not only went to the Missouri Supreme Court, but went to the United States Supreme Court for each of those individuals. Let's use this as an opportunity to stop for a second for these commercials. Along the way, when I mentioned this torturous journey for the Harrisons and anyone involved with this case, including all the detectives, the first scheduled execution day was for Taylor. Was Taylor Michael Taylor was February two thousand and six. In this book, you talk about the execution process. We've read about it before and heard about it before, but maybe not in the kinds of personal detail that you conveyed. But tell us about this first time, this first scheduled execution, and then the process for those people that are to witness the execution, including the Harrisons. 
The first execution date was scheduled for Michael Taylor. The process for the witnesses for the state, which I wrote about for Taylor's first process of going through the preparations for execution. You get a letter from the state. They give you instructions when to appear, what to bring, what not to bring, which was pretty Spartan. You were at that time allowed a pen and a pad of paper to go in. When you arrived at the prison, you were greeted at the front gate by corrections officers. They checked your vehicle. They radioed. They sent you to another gate. You were brought in, escorted by corrections officials. They had the various groups segregated so that witnesses for the state would be brought in at a certain time. Family witnesses uh, for the execution would be brought in separately and kept apart from those individuals. And the media and any protesters were kept outside on yet another side of the prison. They were isolated away so that there was no potential for any conflicts, if you will, or disturbances. The individuals were walked through. You, there was a sign-in process. You were searched. You went through a metal detector. You had to lock up all your belongings, which had been searched. And you were escorted through the facility. And having been in law enforcement, to me, I it was very much the process in which I would have handled a prisoner, someone that I had under arrest for, for whatever reason. And again, these are the witnesses, but you are in a correctional facility. You're escorted down a long corridor. There was someone behind two-way glass who slid out a little drawer and you put your identification in. They, it was very quiet. There was no talking except to give you an instruction on providing your identification or where to go stand. And you were walked through and taken into a small cinder block room with some tables and chairs. And you sat there and waited. You did not get a lot of information. The prison, the corrections officers were not allowed to talk to you except to give you an instruction. So it was very quiet. It was stressful. It was somber. And you waited for someone to come in and, and say, it's now eight, you arrived at six o'clock. It is now eight o'clock. Here's what's going to happen at 10 o'clock. Executions are conducted at just about one minute after midnight. They do them in the early morning so that if there is a stay and an appeal that needs to go through, they have still have within that 24-hour period, the opportunity to move, proceed with the execution or to stop the execution based on a stay. So it was very start and stop. People would walk into the room. They would look at you, talk amongst themselves, people from the prison. We got down to the wire with Taylor's potential execution and someone from the prison came in, said there is an appeal that the Missouri Supreme Court was going to hear the case and there would be no execution and you were escorted back to your vehicle and, and just sent away pending the next step in the process, if there was an appeal, if there would be a determination that the Supreme Court would overrule the death penalty sentence and, and say, now we're going to give them life in prison. or So you, it was just a waiting game. And this occurred over and over and over with between the two individuals. You write that Roderick Nunley was belligerent before he was sentenced to prison, but behind bars, he continued with that. And then when he thought that not much could go on in his case, he had permission to visit the library for information for his appeal, and he attacked with a homemade knife one of the unit managers in prison. So this is 2006. You talk about 2010. He went through the same procedure again with for it was scheduled for execution and would be, as you write, another four years to 2014 to finally the Harrisons and the witnesses and the detective, one of the detectives w was present at this execution. Tell us about this eventual execution 
2014. The execution process is not in any way, shape, or form what you would see in portrayed in movies like Dead Man Walking or The Green Mile. The individual who's being executed cannot see the witnesses or the family. You're taken in, you are escorted into a room with chairs and risers so that the witnesses for the state or witnesses for the family on the other side. You're in a, a room with it's the lights are, are turned down, so it's fairly dark in the room. There is a set of windows in front of you with curtains. At the appointed time, the curtain opens. You are able to see the individual who is on a gurney. It's very quiet. You cannot see the other individuals who are in the room with the individual being executed. It's a very sterile environment. It is not unlike a surgical suite, although you don't have overhead lights or whatever. They are, again, on a gurney covered from toes to chin with a, a white sheet. It's a very peaceful process. There is not a lot of noise. In Taylor's case, you could see in the distance, if you will, another set of windows on the other side of the room where the other witnesses would be. He turned his head away from us or to the left, to his left, appeared as though he, his lips were moving, turned his head back to where he was looking at the ceiling. You waited a couple of minutes. You could barely tell that, that he was possibly breathing. The curtains closed. The curtain reopened and a few minutes later and you were told by one of the prison officials in the room that, and it wasn't said directly to the people there, it was just announced that the individual was deceased at 12.08 a.m. and they read the date. Curtains closed again and that was it. It was, and understandably in the state of Missouri, the method that is used for execution is not unlike the same method that people who elect to end their own lives. It, Dr. Kevorkian, I think, probably is, is the best description that I can give people who are not familiar with the process. You're administered pentobarbital, which if you were a cancer victim or had some other disease and elected to end your life in a right to die situation, a country, or in, in the United States, a couple of states that allow that, it's administered exactly the same way where they find that there are cases where someone potentially has had difficulty of the individual being executed. Statistics show that those individuals had been lifelong IV drug users, and so their veins are very fragile to begin with. So any potential IV hospitalization, medical procedure could have resulted in, in the same type of problems, a blood clot, a collapsed vein, that they possibly would experience going through that process. But again, it was very quiet. It was very sterile. And it was very dignified, which is so counterintuitive to what Anne experienced, which was so violent, so horrific, so painful and cruel and brutal. The trying to imagine the difference between the two situations, these individuals were allowed to die with dignity, whereas Anne was not. You talk about the closure for the Harrisons, and you write that they said that this is the only form of closure that they could receive, then they would gladly take it. So again, it really puts in perspective what they mean by closure and what it meant to them to be able to witness the execution for the murder of their daughter. You talk about evil as an afterword in this in this book. And 
we didn't get into a lot of the details that came up from these two perpetrators that were trying to blame each other for the crime. But in the process, they gave horrendous, ghastly details of their behavior that night, such as uh, Nunley asking Taylor to go into the home and, and get a knife and get two knives, a butcher knife and another serrated knife. Details like he w- he said to one said to the other that when they were doing the rape that she was too tight and so he needed some grease and so one of them went gladly and went and got some hair gel grease some tcp grease to help out this and enable this rapist you talk about evil in your afterward tell us what you had to say i i think that it's very difficult for any individual, any reason, reasonably minded individual to wrap their head around events that took place, such as in Anne's case. And there is, I think Shakespeare said it best, that there are no devils in hell, they walk amongst us. And there's no there's no way to say why these things have happened to good people. I think that in order to measure goodness, kindness in this world, there has to be something to compare it to, and and that would be evil. You you can't put your hands around around it. Evil's clear. There's no color to it. There's I call it colorless, formless. But without evil. There's no good. It's hard to measure, measure goodness. I compared it to a piece of glass, a thin piece of glass. You, If you can't see it, you walk up to it, try to walk through it. There's no warning. And like that, it can shatter and causes, causes a great amount of pain. I, I talked about evil being a four-letter word, but then there are also four-letter words that I think we take comfort in, and that's love and hope, heal. And I think with the execution of Taylor and Nunley, that allowed the Harrisons and their daughters and their extended family and our community an opportunity to heal. I don't think you, I know that you don't ever get over it. So to talk about form of closure it's a resolution. It gave them the opportunity to close a chapter in their lives, to not have to deal with the appeals, not to have to deal with facing these individuals in court time and time again as they did. It is less justice and more retribution, but I think it did give them the opportunity to heal and gave our community who really rallied around this family. And to this day, people remember where they were, where they when they heard that Anne was missing. It's kind of hate to liken it to, to the enormity of remembering where you were when John Kennedy was assassinated. But on a small scale in our community, people really do remember this case. And that was one of the, the reasons why I wanted to write the book, to give people an opportunity to, to talk about it, know the end, the outcome, the finality of it, and, and to heal. I want to thank you so much, Marla Bernard, for coming on and talking about your book, By the Side of the Road, The True Story of the Abduction and Murder of Anne Harrison. For those that might want to take a look at this and more information and about your other book, is there a website and do you do any social media? I am on Facebook as Marla Bernard. I also have a website. It's the pen name that I use for some of my creative writing. It's called scarletinkwell.com and it's one word, scarlet with two T's, inkwell.com. Thank you so much, Marla Bernard, By the Side of the Road, The True Story of the Abduction and Murder of Anne Harrison. Thank you so much. You have a great evening and good night. Thank you.